Jesus' name, amen. And let me say this too. This sermon was on the books a long time ago. This, I'm not a subtle person. This is, like, this is not like, oh, I'm going to try to subtly pastor them through this moment, through this text. Maybe God will, but if I was listening to myself preach this text, I'd be like, okay, Smith, like you're trying to say things, but you're not really. So I'm not, right? So let's, let's roll through this. Uh, and it is kind of weird because in a few moments, I'll tell you this text is about, here's what the text is about. What's on the other side of this moment? <laughs> but I'm not talking about what's on the other side of this moment. All right, so here's the deal. When I moved to Trumbull, Connecticut, I kept seeing these signs in December about um, the Nichols Jingle Bell Run. Is that what it's called, the Jingle Bell Run? And back 10 years ago or so, I thought running was a whole lot more fun. And so I thought, man, I'm going to do this. And so I didn't know much about it. It's a 5K. It runs through Trumbull. And I, here's what I did, though, because I don't like to be surprised. I said to myself, self, I am going to drive through this course before the race because I want to see the twists and turns, and I want to see what's coming. I want to prepare myself to know. And so I drove, and then at one point in the old course, there's this hill that comes. And so I started to hit this little hill, and I thought, oh my goodness, what's on the other side of this hill? Like, when I get done, is it going to be good? Is it going to be bad? And so I'm like, okay, there's a hill. And then I drove over that hill, and then there was a, you know what's on the other side of a hill? Downhill. And I'm like, oh, this is so sweet. There's a downhill. So I'll be easy. And then I ran down the hill. You know, I, I knew I'd be running down the hill a little bit. But then at the bottom of that hill, do you know what my car looked up and saw? Another really, really big hill. And I thought to myself, oh, there's another really, really big hill. And then I thought to myself, what's going to be on the other side of that hill? I thought to myself, when well, I'm running my race and I'm tired by now, and there's this second hill that comes, like, what's after that? Like, what is going to be on the other side of this moment in the race? And I made it through the Jingle Ball run a few times. And then there was this moment where some of your children passed me. <laughs> and they were very nice. I was like, <gasps> and they were like, bye, Pastor Peter. And that's, that was my last Jingle Bell run. I <laughs> hung up my shoes. But, but if you've ever run a 5K, if you've ever run a race, if you've ever had that moment, you do kind of wonder when you're running it, what is on the other side of this obstacle or this challenge that comes? Is it going to get any easy, easier? And in today's text, what God tells the readers and what he is pausing in the story of Revelation is to kind of remind them and give them some insight about what's on the other side of the moment that they're facing. He's trying to tell them after you get through this moment that you're going through, he wants to give them some truth and give them some encouragement about what's on the other side of that. That's what Revelation 14 verses 1 through 11 are about. That's what we're going to start talking about today. And let's think for a moment about what these Christians are experiencing. If you've been with us through our study or even if you've been with us for the past couple of weeks, um, <clears throat> the, these Christians have been hearing about these readers who in the early church themselves were actually facing some persecution, but they've been reading about this future moment that's going to come where the persecution is going to ramp up. And for the past two chapters, you and I have heard about what's going to come down the road in the future for Christians, and the original readers would have heard that. And here's what we've studied about what's yet to come. Here's what they've heard about what's yet to come. Revelation 12, 17, we talked about how Satan was kicked out of heaven for the final time, and then we saw that this this prediction about what's going to happen. The dragon became furious with a woman and went off to make war on the rest of her offspring. The symbolism there is that this rest of her offspring is and are people who follow God. And so the original readers would have heard these comments about, man, there's this moment coming that not just now are we being persecuted, but a yet future moment where Satan is going to kind of drill down and focus his attack on Christians. And then as the text continued, we moved into chapter 13, and we saw that this attack was going to be through a human leader. And this human leader was going to direct people to worship them. 
And if these people didn't worship this human leader who was being used by the enemy, then the consequence was going to be that they would be killed. And then what these Christian readers heard about then was, oh, and by the way, if in this future moment, and again, we're taking one approach to the book of Revelation. And if this is the, um, you know, may not be the right approach, but this is the approach that we're taking. There's several different approaches. But then not only would they hear that they'd be killed, they would hear that, hey, and in the future, if you want to buy or sell, if you want to do commerce, if you want to do trade, unless you have this mark of this human leader, you won't be able to do it. And so what they've been processing is this moment to come in the future as themselves are being persecuted, of increasing focused persecution on them as Christians, as a human leader arising in the future. And Satan is committed to trying to make life as challenged as he can for God's people. He's going to work through this human leader. And this human leader is going to kill people that don't worship him. And this human leader is going to make people have this mark if they want to eat. And In this moment, as in several moments in the book of Revelation, imagine probably some of you as you're hearing that, you're like, bro, it's Mother's Day. That's not very encouraging, right? We feel it. I mean, this is like when we feel like, oh, this is is not pleasant. This is heavy. This is sobering. These Christians were hearing this word, and they themselves were already being persecuted. And you can imagine they would have been anxious. They would have been discouraged. They would have been scared. They would not have known what to think. But the amazing thing that we see throughout Revelation and the amazing thing that this chapter itself tells us is that, you know what? In moments when we're anxious, in moments when we're scared, in moments when we don't know what to think, in moments when we are discouraged, God is a God of encouragement. God is a God of encouragement. And so God pauses in Revelation chapter 14 like he's done before, and he wants to take a moment to say, okay, Christians, I put a lot of heavy stuff on you, but let me encourage you. Let me tell you what is coming after that moment. Let me tell you what is on the other side of that hill. Let me tell you about the amazingly rich, beautiful, excellent, great things that are in store on the other side of that. In this chapter, and because it is Mother's Day, we're going to talk about this next week, but He's going to tell Christians, guys, you're in it now, and all this is going to be unpleasant. But there, Christians, there is something so beautiful waiting for you on the other side of it. There is something so beautiful on the other side of all the junk that you're going to go through. But then in the chapter, and we'll talk about this next week, there's also this warning for people who don't believe in Jesus. Because he tells them what's going to be on the other side of their story. And it's sobering, and it's heavy, and there's implications for you and for me, and that's going to be next week. But this week, we're going to think about how does God encourage these people. And I think it's just a great reminder that in moments when we feel discouraged, which we all do, in moments when we feel discouraged, which we all do, we do have a God who knows what you're feeling. We do have a God who knows what's discouraging you. And we have a God who is in an amazingly rich sense of encouragement. And he's going to encourage his readers here today through his word. And when you and I face discouragement, we can go to all sorts of places to try to be encouraged. But one amazing resource we have is God's word still today for us. It is not a switch. It may not instantly make us feel encouraged but it's a place we can just go to and just go to and just immerse ourselves in. And then in his grace, should God choose to work through our putting ourselves before him through his word, encouragement will come. So let's move into the text. How does God try to encourage them? What's going on here? Revelation 14, verse 1. Then I looked, and behold, on Mount Zion stood the Lamb, And with him, 144,000 who had his name and his father's name written on their foreheads. This is an image 
of the, what God's giving them is this image of this group of people who are safely in the presence of Jesus. It's a group of people who are safely in the presence of Jesus. And what John writes is that they're gathered on Mount Zion. And there's all sorts of ideas about what Mount Zion is referring to. Some people think it refers to, like, actually, literally, Mount Zion. Here's a picture of Mount Zion. And it is the highest point in in the Jerusalem area outside of the old city of Jerusalem. And so if you go to the old city of Jerusalem today, you will see this hill, and that hill on the outskirts of the city is Mount Zion. Interestingly, Mount Zion has kind of been like moved around on the Google Maps a few times, but some people, Mount Zion has a huge track record to the scripture. And so some people think that this is actually Jesus is going to be here uh, and that's what's the literal Mount Zion. Other people think that it's symbolic to represent Jesus' earthly kingdom and other people think it's a metaphor for strength. Some people think it's the heavenly Jerusalem and it could be any one of those. But regardless of where it is, one of the huge points is that Jesus is there And these people are gathered there with him, safely gathered there with him, this 144,000 people. In Revelation 7, we've talked about these folks before, um, we saw about the 144,000. And interestingly, if you come from a Jehovah's Witness tradition, or you have friends who are in the Jehovah's Witnesses, this number is a huge part of their worldview and belief system, right? The, the 144,000 is, is foundational in their wrong belief about things. But we, we saw this group before in Revelation chapter 7. And if you want to hear more about it all, you can listen to that sermon. But what we said was, hey, symbolically, that my take and a lot of commentators take is that it's not literally 144,000. That's symbolically that number for right reasons represents fullness or completeness of something. It's like the total number is all gathered together. Then the question is, well, what is this group? And like we talked about, there's two main options that it could be Jewish Christians or it could be the church big C, which is Jewish Christians and non-Jewish Christians. There's kind of a split where some people say, well, this is just showing the completeness of all Jewish Christians, and other people are saying, no, 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 it encompasses more than that. It is all Christians gathered together. And what's really interesting about this is the text tells us that these guys had the name of God on their forehead. Really interesting contrast to other groups of people that had the name of the beast on their forehead. They had the name, uh, Father's name, Revelation 14.1, written on their foreheads. And what is this group of people doing? What is going on in this moment, verses 2 to 3? And I heard a voice from heaven like the roar, roar, I cannot say that word, roar. All right, can I, I've not told you this for 10 years. I couldn't say my R's when I was a small child. (laughs) I went went to speech therapy, which is fine. Like, that's no big deal. No, it's not. It's really not. Because, like, I had to, and a lot of people have to, and that's what it is what it is. I went to speech therapy. The cool thing about that is when I could say that letter properly, (laughs) one of my teachers is laughing at me right now. When I could say that letter properly... I remember getting these Star Wars action figures. Here's what's not funny about that story. On eBay, those Star Wars action figures would be worth about $72,000 right now. But my mom probably threw them out the moment I brought them home. So whatever. Anyway, the text tells us that you guys are like, please bring a godly pastor that just, (laughs) please. And I heard a voice from heaven, like that word of many waters. And like the sound of thunder, the voice I heard was like the sound of harpists playing on their harps, and they were singing a new song before the throne and before the four living creatures and before the elders. No one could learn that song except the 144,000 who had been redeemed from the earth. 
new song, right? They were singing this new song. This is really, really important. There's a group of Christians, whether it's all Christians or Jewish Christians, there's a group of this people of God who have gone through incredible, incredible pain and suffering and hardship and persecution, and some of them death. But there's this image of on the other side of that is this group, this totality of Christians gathered with their king. And all around that moment is this worship service, not with dry ice and lights, not that that's bad, but like this angelic, spiritual, amazing worship service where they're singing this new song. A new song in the Old Testament, you hear it a lot. Many times when God helped his people defeat an enemy, what those people would do would be to get together and they would write and they would then sing a new song as thanks to God. A new song was sung throughout the Old Testament when God provided for his people, when God delivered his people. And it's this call for people like, we're going to sing this song because God came through for us, because God showed up, because God kept his promises, because God brought us through, because God didn't drop us, and we're going to write this song, and we're going to sing this song, and we're going to go playing this song now because of what God did, and this song will give us confidence and hope for what God will continue to do the next time we're in circumstances that are wearing us out. Some interesting descriptions of these people who are singing this new song. The text tells us three things about these people in verses 4 through 5. It is these, it says, who have not defiled themselves with women, for they are virgins. It is these who follow the Lamb wherever He goes. These who have been redeemed from mankind as the first fruits for God and the Lamb. And in their mouth no lie was found, for they are blameless. Let's make sure we understand what these phrases mean. It is these who have not defiled themselves with women, for they are virgins. A couple of different ways that that phrase can be taken. Some people take it literally, but it doesn't really make sense to take it literally, because if this is referring to Jewish Christians or all Christians, some of those people will have had relationships with their wives or their spouses, and having relationships with your spouse is not defiling, and so it can't really, doesn't seem like it's literal. Other people say, well, it's just like spiritual language to say that they kept themselves pure. That, that sexually they kept themselves pure in a world where there was all this corruption and that's part of how the beast is going to try to tempt people blah, blah, and kept themselves pure. Could be, but could be. Could be. But what else is interesting is throughout the Old Testament and even the New Testament, the nation of Israel at different moments was referred to as a virgin waiting for their king. And in the New Testament, Look how Paul describes Christians in 2 Corinthians 11:12. He's talking about people in a church, and he said, I feel a divine jealousy for you since I betrothed you to one have husband to present you as a pure virgin to him. And what Paul's doing there is, is using this phrase to refer to how Christians are the bride of Christ, that Christians are the bride of Christ who are waiting for Jesus to come back when they will have this metaphorical marriage with him and they will be reunited and they will be together and how the bride of Christ, how the church is supposed to keep themselves pure, right? Just in every aspect as they wait for Jesus to come back. It seems to be this image of Christians who are waiting to see Jesus come back again, who are the bride of Christ, Man, maintaining this purity until they can be with the one that they've been longing to be with face-to-face, person-to-person. Another interesting phrase in this text is they're referred to as those who follow the Lamb wherever He goes. Those who follow the Lamb wherever He goes, which is part, well, fully (laughs) 
the motivation of what we already shared this morning about our story. <clears throat> and the third co concept about them is this, that in their mouth no lie was found. In their mouths no lie was found. During this period of the tribulation when there's all sorts of lies about God, when there's all sorts of lies about truth, when there's all sorts of lies about this false leader that is taking the place of Christ, what these people did is they're like, no way, bro, I'm going to claim to the truth. I'm not going to buy into the lies. I'm not going to propagate the lies. I'm holding on to the truth. Pure in their walk and in their story, waiting for their king to come back following their king no matter where he leads them and clinging to and aligning with and standing for the truth of God. That's a snapshot of what these people are like who maintained those values and those priorities no matter what they faced in their story and in their experience, who have gotten safely home and are worshiping with their king. And the question is, in terms of application, does that describe me? And does that describe you? And does that describe us? Can, can those three things be said about us? That as people who belong to Jesus, we are trying to remain pure for Jesus. And I don't just mean sexually, but I do mean sexually. But not just that, but in all sorts of aspects, pure in our walk, pure in our trust, pure in our worship, pure in our following for him. Is that able to be said about us this morning? Or is there something that you'd be like, no, man, there's something going on in my story that's, that, that, that wouldn't be said about me. What about the next one? I, I love that line, right? Those who follow the Lamb wherever He goes. Wherever He goes. God is not the God of the status quo. Fairfield County is the God of get as much comfort as you can, get as much stability as you can, get as much success as you can, and then you don't let anything take that away. You keep building upon that. But right, our, the values around us are, man, you get everything you can to be as secure as you can, and then you just have the, the illusion that you can just hold on to that forever. That, that's not the story of Jesus. The story of Jesus is not trying to maintain the status quo, but being willing to let go of the status quo to follow Jesus wherever, wherever he leads. And sometimes... God will lead you to leave a... And maybe he's, do, he's leading you somewhere this morning. He is. There, there is something for every single one of us who is a follower of Jesus that he does want us to do. He, he doesn't want us just to not do anything for him. There's something that he wants you to do, that he's leading you to do, that he's preparing you to do, and that can be as apparently insignificant as going to your neighbor and telling them that you were sorry that you screamed at them the other day about their leaves. I'm not kidding. It is shocking the way neighbors treat neighbors sometimes. And it is shocking the way Christians treat their neighbors sometimes. Are we lunatics? Like, who cares? Like the guy's little bag of leaves fell over accidentally and four leaves are on your driveway and you're screaming at him. And then not only are you screaming at him, but you refuse to say you're sorry. And maybe what God is asking you to do, in the and I'm just telling you, Christians often have a hard time saying we're sorry. We have a hard time saying we're sorry because you know why? We mess up. We do something we shouldn't do. We go do our devotions and then we're like, no, me and God are good. Well, I don't know. So I'd have to think about that theologically. You are good, but you still have to get good with the person that you've offended. And, and maybe when this phrase is, will you follow Jesus wherever he leads you to go, maybe you need to go to that neighbor and say, I'm sorry. Kids, maybe you were, um, I'm trying to, uh, maybe you were not kind to your parents. I was going to say jerk, but it's not good to say jerk in church, I've been told. <laughs> but, but kids, maybe that's what you were, maybe that's what you were to your parents. Maybe you were. Maybe you said things to them this weekend when they put some boundaries on you that were just not appropriate. And, and you know what you need to do, students? You need to go to your mom and dad and say, I'm sorry. 
And moms and dads, maybe you were tired and you were exhausted and your kid did something that frustrated you and, and you just snapped. And if you want to have children that apologize to you when they're wrong, you need to be parents that apologize to your children when you're wrong. And maybe that is where God is leading you to go. Maybe God is. We had this, this amazing story, this young lady that a few missions conferences ago, a year or so ago, came to a mission conference, never heard about unreached people groups before, that planted a seed in this room, in this 20-year-old's heart, who was on this trajectory to go career, business, blah, 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 blah. And she sent me an email that I forwarded around to the missions team where she said, you know what, because of that seed at Calvary Church, I know that God is calling me to leave behind my business and my career and go be a missionary and serve him in India. And maybe for some of you, where God's saying to you is, hey, I-, I want you to leave where you're going and go do something. Maybe God's calling you to break up with a relationship that is not healthy, it is dysfunctional, they're not a believer and it's not good. I don't know what he's calling you to do. But the question is, is if he's calling you, are you willing to follow him wherever he leads? And you need to answer that question now. You need to. Because if I were to try to answer that question in the midst of all this in my story right now, I could get all flip side because I don't want to go. You need to know beforehand and commit yourself to say, God, when you lead, where you lead, I'm going to go. Don't be trying to wrestle through whether you're going to do that in the moment because it's going to be hard enough to do it in the moment. You already have to know the answer to the question. Is God this morning leading you to do something? If he is, will you follow. And can it be said in our story that we're clinging to following God's truth? It, again, that's always in every generation an issue. What do we do with this? And every generation and every decade and every century has had to decide, am I going to, what is going to be the authority? That's the simple decision. And the authority is going to be some other worldview. The authority is going to be you. Or the authority is going to be this. But it can't be all three. It's got to be something. And are we willing to say, I am anchoring myself to this. And this is what's going to drive what I do. But in that, And I'll ask the worship team to come up and Dave to come up and we'll punt the rest of this until next week. Um, Let's not miss the big idea and let's throw that last point on the deal. Here's the first thing that Christians can expect. Here's what God wants them to know is on the other side of this incredibly difficult hill that they're facing. On the other side of the pain of this world, of the suffering of this world, of the injustice of this world, is this hope fully fulfilled. The reason that you and I are not fully fulfilled in this world is because this world can never fully fulfill us. And what that lack of fulfillment teaches us, even if you're not a Christ follower, even if you think the book's not true, you know that you're not satisfied. You do. You know that you want to be satisfied. You know that there's things that temporarily satisfy you. But then you know what? It's like my delicious cup of tea in the afternoon. Where that seeps for three minutes, the perfect amount of time. And then I drink it, and it satisfies me for a minute, but you know what? The next day, I want me some more tea. It doesn't fully satisfy. And we know that there's things in this world that don't fully satisfy us. We, we still long for something because we were made for something more. And one day, we will experience that on the other side of this. Hope fully fulfilled. Complete delight. Overwhelming joy. And man, I can't wait for this one. Total peace. If you are a follower of Jesus, you will not have this in this world. And if somebody tells you you will, they are lying to you. Because Jesus tells you you won't. But what the Father is telling us now is one day, someday, all of this will be all that you know. And so, keep pressing on. Keep pressing on. And you will not want to press on sometimes. And that's okay. That's okay. 
it's okay when the depression hits and you just want to stay in bed. You can't stay in bed forever. And at some point, even when you don't feel like pressing on, at some point when you've processed through I not, we all got to still get up and we got to take that next step, even if we don't want to, in hope of this, walking towards this. Don't give up. Keep pressing on. Because this is what's waiting for you. Next week, we're going to see one more thing. And the next week, uh, we're going we're to talk about that's the story for Christians, but what does the Bible say about is the story for non-Christians? There was a guy, Rob Bell, a few years ago, created all sorts of uh, uproar. We'll kind of walk through what's the eternal reality, according to the Bible, for people who don't know Jesus. Um, and th that is going to have some implication and some application for us. So uh, thank you for getting through Revelation with me. Next week, we're going to be back for the rest of Revelation 14. So bring your Bible device, grab a bulletin, and... Uh, if I'm not here, I'll be at Pulpit Rock sharing that sermon. So, uh, LaMare, come on up, man.